Okay. So again, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank the friends and thank all of the communities <clears throat> that have supported this event. Um, tonight's event is Ireland a travel up for St. Patrick's Day. I'm excited to see so many people here the, to learn more about um, Ireland, see lots of great videos pictures and historical information. Um, this presentation will focus <clears throat> on um, Dana's 2017 Castles and Manors trip to Ireland. Sharing his extensive knowledge, Dana will offer many humorous stories from multiple travels. Uh, he, his plan is to transport attendees through his presentation to the Emerald Isle, <clears throat> the visit also includes stops at the Rock of Cashiel, Ring of Kerry, Kylemore Abbey, Phoenix Park, and the Irish Potato Famine Museum, among others. Dana is a retired pharmacist from northern from Norton, Massachusetts, who loves to tra travel and share his experience with others. He and his wife Kathy have traveled to Switzerland, Australia and the Galapagos Islands, Ireland, and the Amazon. In addition to his love of travel, Dana is an amateur historian who has published five times on the subject of the American Civil War and is the current president of the Old Colony Civil War Roundtable of Data Mass. So thank you very much. And I will pass the screen over to you, Dana. Can you All right, let's just make sure. That, can, can you see the first? Uh, I can. It says Ireland tour of castles. Yes, I can. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's just make sure it. And it advances. OK, yeah, hopefully it, it, it did it advance on your end. It did. OK, all right. Let's just uh, get started, but I'll uh, issue a disclaimer, I guess. I'm not an expert on Ireland. This is just a little talk on uh, where we went to, what we saw. Uh, we did what they call a castles and manors tour. You would tour some of the highlights during the uh, a day, and then at night you would stay in a castle or a country manor. And uh, it was pretty. It was a it was a great time. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I just don't want you to think that that it's I'm an expert though. Uh, We'll discuss how much the Irish love the English and how much the English love the Irish. Yeah, right. If you believe that, uh, I'll tell you some more. Uh, there's uh, a lot of the friction, plus the uh, uh, you have the Catholic and Protestant religions. And also we're, we're going to get into some of the conflicts that Ireland had with their uh, uh, English friends. So uh, Ireland is kind of shaped like a saucer. Uh, it's flat in the middle, and it has hills around the end, around the edge of it. Uh, the largest island in Europe, it has 4.65 million people. 50% are under the age of 25. Now, when we would go to a hotel or a manor, most of the people that waited on us was English as a second language. They're all from uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, unfortunately, the young Irish kids, they don't want to take those jobs. So uh, that was probably similar to what we have going on here. Uh, they have a poor, narrow road system. They they did have a couple of main highways that we took, and those were good. <clears throat> minute you got off of that, boy, the roads were really narrow, and if you met somebody coming the other way, well, you, you were in trouble. Uh, they have eight paid holidays a year. <clears throat> they call them bank holidays because the, the farmers still have to go back to work. The bankers get it off. Uh, some of you, when you started working, you got two weeks vacation and are lucky to have that. They have five weeks vacation and some companies even offer six weeks vacation. They have a property tax. And when you're driving down the road, you'll see a lot of houses that do not have roofs on them. The roofs are removed. And if the roof is not there, the property is not taxed. So that's their way of getting around the uh, property tax. They have the value added tax, the VAT tax, but different uh, 
in fact, they have a little problem sometimes when they come here. You know, if you're in Ireland, if it's marked, say, 10 euros, you go and you pay 10 euros. Here, if it's marked $10 in Massachusetts, you'd pay, uh, you'd go up with your $10 and they'd say that'll be 1062. So uh, we add the tax on at the end, they add it on during the process, and it's all included in the price. They had numerous revolts. Uh, I was going to write up a a, couple, a slide and uh, on some of the listing some of their revolts, but uh, I would have been here all night. Uh, they were always revolting uh, against British rule. Um, the, we're going to discuss the Irish potato famine. Some of you, most of you, should be familiar with that. In 1922, they finally gained independence. But what I found interesting, they remained neutral during World War II. Uh, they just said, okay, you know, England, go ahead. You can go off and fight, but we're, we're not going to, uh, we're going to sit this one out. They are a member of the European Union, and they use the euro for their currency. Now, this is a map that shows basically where we're going. We're going to fly into Dublin, going to go down uh, south. And where that circle is down in the lower left is the ring of Kerry. And uh, it's, again, a, a narrow road. They make all the buses and uh, travel what they call anti-clockwise, which we would call counterclockwise. And they uh, do that because if you have one bus coming one way and one the other, somebody's got to back up because there's just no room. Uh, so everybody uh, has to go the same direction on the tour guides, uh, tour buses. This one is the Radisson Hotel. It was a big country man manor. It was built in 1750, and the family had to have big bucks at that time. When you go in there, there's just marble and just, just beauty like you wouldn't believe. And you can see how the ground is landscaped. This is something that a family could not afford nowadays between heating it, bringing in all of your uh, uh, servants and the upkeep and people that you'd need for the landscapers. And they'd just be too much. So a lot of the people who own these big houses turn them over to management groups, hotel management groups, so that they can uh, uh, get some money out of, out of them, have the company uh, run the hotel and then just give them a fee. This is the back of that the house. If you're wondering how many fireplaces there are, just look at the chimneys up above. Uh, that's it's kind of impressive because uh, that, that's how they heated back then. But this is the back, and uh, they also, if in the far back there in the grassy area, they can put up tents there. They can uh, have uh, weddings and other uh, functions there. Very beautiful, uh, beautifully landscaped backyard. Uh, and this was in October, uh, the uh, Gulf Stream comes close to Ireland. So you don't get a lot of extreme weather there. So their uh, flowers were, even though we were there, uh, I want to say mid-October, they still had plenty of flowers growing there. Now, this is one of my idiosyncrasy. I am a, a historian. And I, I don't know how many of you take pictures of uh, lamp posts, but uh, I do. Uh, I saw that one and I said, wow, they don't make them like that anymore. I would I would guess 1800s, maybe 1890s. Um, and it was probably, I'm guessing again, it was probably gas that they converted over to, uh, uh, to electricity. But uh, when I saw the workmanship there, I just was in awe of it because they don't, they don't make them like that anymore. So I figured I'd take a quick picture of it. Now, some of you, oops, some of you are familiar with the Dublin doors. Some of you may not. Uh, Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, died suddenly in 1861, and she was in mourning. She and she wanted the Irish people to join her in her uh, hour of uh, mourning, and she requested that the doors all be painted black. So that was what the, the Irish were told. And when you tell the Irish something, you get doors that kind of look like this, sort of a yellowish shade of black. And uh, 
maybe a bluish shade of black. They, uh, so our tour guide said it was a good example of the Irish being Irish. You know, if you tell them to do something, they may not do that. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, hatred, and we're going to go into that more later. But the the Irish and the English, of course, never got along. So uh, the minute they had a chance to do a little uh, rebellion, rebellious act like this, this is what they did. This one is painted black, but notice they had plenty of white there just to uh, kind of thumb their nose at the uh, queen. Now, no uh, visit to Dublin is complete unless you uh, go to the Guinness Brewery. Um, it really, when you go there, it's not really a brewery. Uh, you see it's a retired building. Like they, It used to be a brewery, and they have a lot of the equipment there, and you can walk through and see that. And on every floor, there's a gift shop. So they really push that. But when you get to the top floor, you can get a good pint of the of the black stuff, and the uh, uh, and you are sitting in a bar that has a three hundred and sixty degree view of the city. So you're at a nice high point, and you can wherever you sit, you have a view, and uh, and you you get a free uh, glass of uh, of Guinness at the time. The large tall building to the left, that is uh, a monument to the uh, Duke of Wellington who defeated uh, Napoleon. And all the trees that are there, that is Phoenix Park. Uh, there's a park right in the middle of Dublin. It is twice the size of Central Park here in the US, five times the size of Hyde Park in London. Uh, this one I probably should change. It's home to their White House. I should say their executive mansion because you know, because we have the White House. But uh, also in this area in the park is home to the U.S. Embassy. Now, we did uh, meet a few of the residents of Phoenix Park. There are deer there. That's in the middle of the city. And these guys had their, uh, the big racks of uh, antlers there. Uh, they were, were, are not uh, native to Ireland. They were brought over by the Normans. The Normans knew if they brought a bunch of them over, nature being such as it is, if they brought over 10 within a couple of years, they'd have 100, and now they'd have a source of food. So they were kind of, uh, they, they're not native. They are uh, uh, brought there, but you will see them all around there, all around the park. They, uh, this is their so-called, uh, well, I'll call it the executive mansion. I kind of took this on the fly as we were go driving by it. Um, if you notice, though, it kind of looks a little bit like our White House, doesn't it? And when you start researching it, you find out that the architect who did their executive mansion also did uh, design the White House in Washington. So they do have some similarities. So the brochure made a big deal when we signed up for this. Irish Stud Farm. And I'm like, why? Why are we going to? What is this? What's the big thing deal with going to a farm with that has horses? Uh, it was privately owned. It's now owned by the Irish government because, like any gambler, the guy who had all the horses, he eventually went broke, and then the Irish government took it over. And I really didn't understand till I got there the fascination with horse racing over there. You could grab a newspaper there and the world could be coming to an end, but the first page is going to tell you all about the different race results. I was kind of uh, amused at uh, uh, how much publicity these races got. And we were there right at the end of the uh, racing season. So uh, everybody was uh, looking forward to the big, big races. Here's some of the horses. And I, th I found that they were, uh, you see, they were pretty intelligent. Uh, we had two types of weather when we were in Ireland. It was either raining or it was getting ready to rain. And uh, most the, it was getting ready to rain right there. But it's interesting, minute it started to rain, those horses just went right under the tree. Meanwhile, the tourist was standing out in the rain. But some real beautiful horses there. Uh, I'm sure probably that brown one is just a colt, but you can, uh, I'm, I'm willing to bet you could bet on him now. 
And this horse was exceedingly smart, walked over and went right to this young lady who was uh, very much into horses. Uh, how the horse picked her out of the crowd and walked right up to her, I don't know, but uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, she's actually a captain in the US Army. Besides race horses, they raise these falabellas. These are small horses, probably come up to your hip or so, and uh, but they're, they're muscular and they were used in the coal mines in Ireland. They would pull the uh, railroad carts from, fill them up with coal and then they would be pulled out by these horses. Well, and you know, Ireland has a lot of uh, legends, uh, uh, legends of fairies and leprechauns. And we were fortunate enough to find the home of one of the uh, fairy uh, families there. Now, like I mentioned this guy uh, who owned the racehorses. At first, he was very good and he was winning. And so he brought over a lot of uh, people from Japan, gardeners from Japan, and they made a Japanese garden for him. So he had his own personal garden. You won't see anyone else there. It was raining. Most of the tourists were inside at the gift shop. Uh, like, I need more junk from the gift shop. So we, we Kathy and I passed on that. And uh, there was a snack bar there. But uh, we just ignored that because uh, we can we can eat when we get home. Uh, how many times do you get to walk through a garden it's like like this? And notice the colors, the greens. Um, that's because it was always raining is why it seems to be always, everything was green there. But the notice of different shades, it was just amazing. And just just walking through the the Japanese gardener uh, on this one, you can see how he used a natural stream that ran through the property to uh, help uh, keep the uh, irrigation going in the garden. Here's a view of the countryside. They have uh, e it's real small on my computer, uh, but uh, right about uh, right near the top, you'll see some white dots. Those are sheep in the uh, pasture. The pastures are community pas pastures, so they will have a lot of. Uh, um, you'll notice that they ha they have like paint markings on their rump. And some might be uh, red, some might be blue. And that's so that when everybody, two or three farmers were in the same pasture, they can tell whose sheep belong to who. Now, uh, the, uh, oops, that was, the uh, weather there is fairly mild because of the Gulf Stream comes right up there. And they don't have a lot of extremes of weather, or if they do, they don't have it for a long period of time. So there's no barns there. You know, we go by a farm, we expect to see a big barn. And they really didn't have any barns there, which was kind of uh, amazing. The, uh, the sheep uh, and any of the farm animals will stay outside uh, all year long. We went to the Rock of Cashel. This is kind of an oddity because you're in a flat area. And in the middle of this flat area, there's this huge outcropping of rock. Now, legend has it that the devil was flying over there. The dragon was, this dragon was going over looking for souls to steal for the for the devil. And he got so mad when he couldn't find any, any, he didn't have any luck that he took a big bite out of one of the mountains. And then he spit it out and it all landed here. And you can see off in the distance, there's a mountain that has sort of an odd shape. And it looks like somebody took a bite out of it almost. So, uh, some college students got together and they analyzed the rocks at in this that were in the rock of Cashel here. And then they went over to where the big gouge was and they analyzed the rocks there. And when they did, they found out that there was absolutely no correlation. It's just a, a legend. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's a, a fun legend. So you get up near the top here. Um, one, well, one clan owned this and they... Uh, uh, here's a view from up, up above there. But one clan owned it, and they and then they ended up losing it to another clan, and that other clan took it over. And, of course, they didn't like that. And then, uh, luck being such as it is, all of a sudden it looked like the first clan was going to take it over again. So what they did is they gave it to the Catholic Church and said, there, now none of you, now you're not going to get it. 
So the Catholic Church owned this for quite a while. Um, notice there's no roofs on there. I, there's inside one of the areas of the church. And it was kind of kind of cool, some of the sculptures and things that still remain after uh, many years, um, probably uh, six, seven hundred years. So what I did is I just, from where I'm standing, I just pointed the camera straight up. And right above me is this big roof made out of stone. And for it to last the, as many years as it has, um, I just found that awesome. Uh, I am a historian, so I, I, I love stuff like that. Um, this is inside the church. Now, the Catholic Church had it, and they painted it with all these beautiful uh, pictures. And a lot of the, because a lot of the people couldn't read, so you would use the pictures to try to explain the uh, uh, the story of Jesus. And uh, then, the, then when uh, the Catholic uh, Protestants took it over, uh, remember King uh, Henry the uh, Eighth uh, broke away from the Catholic Church and started the Church of England. Um, this they they did not. The Protestants said, "Oh." You shouldn't be distracted from your prayers with all these pretty pictures. So they whitewashed it and painted all over everything that was in there. So now when you go in there, we were one of the last groups to go in here. They would be putting up staging just about right after we left. And what they're doing is they're trying to restore it. And they're trying to remove the paint that the Protestants put there so they can see the pictures that were there, uh, the original pictures that were there. So uh, that was kind of uh, interesting, the restoration work. Now, we were there, what, uh, six years ago. So there's, I'm sure there's a lot more progress done on it now. We stayed at the Malton. It was uh, originally called the Great Southern Kalani. And this was about 165 years old. And they, uh, it, was the, it was built by the railroad. The railroad had a, a, a track that went down there and you know, while you're transporting people there, you might as well build a hotel so that you can get an extra fee out of them. Uh, what I heard is that this hotel was being sold again, and they were going to re uh, change it. You know, we were there right at the end of tourist season. So shortly after we left, they were going to bring in guys and change it back to the Great Southern Kalani. But this place was fancy. I mean, you had these beautiful stairwells going up. and uh, just uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm going through there wondering how they let me in here. But uh, this this room, this next room, this was like a little sitting area. I, I don't even think I went in there. I was uh, kind of afraid of it. It's all fancy, you know. I wouldn't want to break anything. But uh, yeah, really, really nice hotel. So then we're going to go around that little peninsula. We're going to make a big loop, go around the Ring of Kerry. And it is a peninsula, so you will see a lot of water. And uh, it it was uh, really nice, really a nice place. Now, of course, if it's raining all the time, I mentioned to you that we did have uh, plenty of rain when we were there. Um, you get rainbows. So there were, uh, it was kind of scenic to see it. Now, what's at the end of the rainbow? All right, you know, a big pot of gold. I was looking, but I couldn't find it. All right. Uh, I like this picture because you can sort of see where the road goes just by the houses. You don't even have to see the road. The, the houses are just all in a line there. And then they have the common pastures there. So I thought that was uh, kind of cool. This happens to be the birthplace of Daniel O'Connell. Now, he was also uh, a person who wanted independence for Ireland. He wanted self-rule. And he started a political party. You had to join uh, and pay one penny, one penny to join. And that was your commitment to getting freedom for Ireland. But the key were here was without violence. He happened to be in Paris and in France uh, during the, about the 1890s when they were doing all that fun stuff, you know, like uh, dragging people to the guillotine and all that. And he witnessed a lot of that. And that was he, he just that was the last thing he wanted to happen to his country. So he uh, that's why he he really said everybody uh, he was really in favor of 
independence, but without violence. That was his thing. If you strain your eyes, you should see a second rainbow above the first one. Uh, nice double rainbow. Just couldn't resist. This place, we had a guy's uh, college professor, uh, and he was going to um, read poetry to us. And I, I'm, I, I hated poetry in high school. But this guy did such a good job explaining everything, uh, Irish poetry, and uh, one of the poets lived nearby. And uh, so, in fact, we're, if you look out straight ahead, uh, his house would have been there uh, 100 years ago is where he lived there. So it was kind of interesting. Listen to this college professor, something unexpected that I, I was not expecting it to be as good as it was. I went to Kate uh, Kearney's cottage. Um, it is a uh, nice little little spot, you know, just an Irish pub. How authentic is it? Uh, let's see if I can get my... Oh, please. All right, here we go. There was... Now, uh, if you... Let's just go back. The guy in the middle here with, uh, with the striped shirt, he has an instrument that looks like bagpipes, if you look at it carefully. But he does not blow into it. On his right arm he's got a strap and what he does is he raises the, his arm up and the bag there fills up with air it's got a valve in there so that it fills up with air and then he squeezes the bag with his arm so when you see this next one here when you see him playing you will see him uh uh with his arm going up and down and this is where i take a slight break We're not getting any audio there. You know, we're not getting any audio. Did the audio come through? No. Ah, son of a gun. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, I was hoping it would come through. They, they are playing there. Take my word for it. They are playing. And if you look right about where my uh, uh, cursor is, what is keeping the music going is a pint of the black stuff. Uh, no audio. Why isn't it going? You can hear me okay, though, normally. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry the, about that. Oh well, uh, no, refunds under at the, the end of the screen. Sometimes there's an, also the icon for share audio, but we can take your word for it too that it was. Fantastic. I'll take my word for it. All yeah. right, I, I I have another one at the end, so uh, I'll work on that. All right, so let's see. What's the next one? There we are. All right, so then we went down to Kalani National Park, and this is the uh, Talk Waterfall. You had to walk through the woods. It was kind of eerie. Uh, just the probably the uh, the weather and everything, the way the sun or, or lack of it was, uh, the light was hitting everything. It just looked really eerie, and you kind of expected to see some sort of a leprechaun jump out at you. Um, it was, uh, and you can you can see all the mold and on the trees that were growing and on the rocks. And just the green, I mean, it was just very uh, weird because we're used to seeing, you know, maybe brown leaves on the ground or whatever. But everything here was green when we were there. It was really uh, kind of interesting, I'll tell you. So then we walked along through the National Park, did a, a short hike, and we over to the uh, Muckross Mansion. And he had he was another person who had a ton of money, built up this huge estate, and then lost all his money. So you walk through all the gardens that they have there, and then you get to the mansion. Now, notice the chimneys. There are 62 fireplaces in this building. They had to hire two people, and the only job they had was to keep the fireplaces going by the time you get the first one going 
and ran down and got to number 62, you then had to run back and do you know, start all over again. So uh, it must have been quite a, a, a job trying to uh, keep 62 fireplaces going all at the same time. Um, the Queen of England actually visited here, Queen Victoria. Uh, he, he, Like I said, before he lost everything uh, and some bad investments. Uh, got a, it's a neat little place. I wish we had gone through it. They do have tours there. Uh, we could not uh, at the time. When you're on a group tour, uh, they have to cut corners sometimes to, um, to get everything in. And unfortunately, this was one of them. But I did get a chance to, this is the view from the uh, the house looking out. And again, when you look at it, you see the different greens and the yellows and all. It was just, it was really, really spectacular place. All right, we're going to Ballynahinch Castle. This was on 700 acres of land. It was built, uh, well, before 1800. I don't know when I was researching it, and I did find a, a thing saying that it was remodeled in 1812. So I, it, it, I figured it had to have been built sometime before 1800 if it was remodeled in 1812. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, prizes that you'll see there because this is the number one place to go fly fishing in Ireland. Uh, there's a trout st a stream that goes through loaded with trout. And they uh, just uh, they have little... Uh, stands and stuff all along where people can go and do little docks and you can stand out on the docks and uh, fly cast from there. This is what it looks like. Not as spectacular as some of the uh, castles we've been in, more of a, a manor, country manor. But one of the things they always had, and this is Irish hospitality, you would have a fire going. Now you figure if your friends walked over from the wherever they lived over from their house to your house in the rain in the cold in the dampness when they get there having a nice warm fire for them to sit by is uh quite a uh welcoming a thing of welcome so they uh that every time we went to a, uh, a hotel or whatever the lobby always seemed to have a fireplace and it would be going the place right along uh, the edge there, that was where our dining room was. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm i am used to Burger King, but uh, this is where we would eat. They would have this real fancy uh, setting and all. Uh, it was really spectacular, this place. And the views out the windows were great. This is basically, you'd see something like this as you were eating. They had uh, uh, gardens there, flowers. Uh, you figure if you're a fly fishing and if you happen to bring the missus with you, there are gardens for her to walk around. Uh, you have all these flowers uh, and uh, walkways. Uh, we got up early one morning. They were supposed to, I think breakfast was at eight. We were up at six and we just went for a long walk all around uh, the uh, uh, well-marked trails that they had there. And they also had a walled garden there. And when I got into the walled garden, I found this uh plant growing here does any let's just check the chat chat who knows what that is what plant that is how is the food food was excellent uh better than england when i was there see i uh, clover clover raspberry i, I was I, I came up i came up with something a little different isn't that more of a oh uh, come on I'm not advancing. Shamrock. Isn't that, isn't that uh, kind of a shamrock there? All right. So uh, somebody asked if the castles were built by the Irish. Uh, I'm not 100% sure because most of the time the Irish were being ruled by English. And, uh, his, you know, it was probably his, the local uh, lordship uh, owned a lot of these. This was a, uh, we went to the cliffs of Moa and there was a storm off the coast or right near the North Atlantic, right on the edge. And uh, I'll tell you, the wind was whipping off. It was one of those where you had to lean into the wind to get up there. And by the time you get up real high, you you know, you're leaning so much to walk into the wind that 
you know, I said, boy, if the wind ever stopped, we're going to fall flat in our faces. But uh, it, it was so bad that they eventually decided to close it after we were there. We After, after we walked down, they were uh, not allowing anyone else to go up there because they felt it was too dangerous. Now, when you get up to the top, this is the view that you see looking back at the cliffs. And yeah, they look big. But then when you realize those are the itty, itty bitty dots at the top of the, uh, those are people. Uh, I think you can see it better in this next one. Yeah, you can see some people there standing there and some of them are silhouetted. Uh, uh, those are people, they're about 700 feet. Uh, there are There is a tour if the weather was better. They do have a tour where you can uh, take a boat down and see them looking up at them. But uh, we, of course, the weather was pretty pretty fierce when we were there. And the last thing you want to do when you when you're there is get too close to the edge. Someone caught a good picture of uh, one of the uh, cliffs starting to crumble. So they have these signs, they have fences and everything. And if you're wondering if anyone is stupid enough to go. Uh, close to the edge well yes there are there, there are people i took pictures of these idiots uh, uh they uh why they felt they had to get that close i i don't know here is uh this was a a, a lighthouse tower like a tower a watchtower and uh, they were built along the coast of ireland during the napoleonic wars they were afraid that uh uh, Napoleon was going to have a fleet come over. The French fleet was going to come over and attack Ireland. So they built these. Uh, you can get an idea of how big they are. There's a gentleman in blue standing right by, right at the base of it. Um, you can go up to the top there, climb up the stairs, get up um, and get a good view. But uh, if uh, if you're wondering how big that, I mean, it looks, it's a decent size uh, watchtower. And when you look at this, you realize, well, you know, compared to the cliffs, it's not really that big. Um, it is the, these cliffs are very impressive, well worth going to see. Uh, next stop, we went to uh, Kyle Moore Abbey. These nuns were in Belgium, I believe, during World War One, and they kind of got chased out. They knew to get out of Dodge. So they made a break for it and got over to Ireland and they built this large abbey. Uh, it is still in use. They have a lot of water that comes off that mountain that's behind them. So that supplied them with drinking water. But then they also decided they would put a uh, uh, generator. And they were, they were one of the first uh, buildings in the area to have electricity. So uh, that was uh, fairly uh, modern for the time. Now, just down the, the road there, you can, a short walk is their church that they built. Uh, it doesn't look that impressive on the inside at first. Uh, this, because it's a bad picture, I'll admit. But this is the, it's, it's a little simple. But when you, you see those columns there, I got a better picture of those columns. They're made out of, they have the marble and they have the green marbles, uh, pink marble, black marble, dark, dark colors. They, uh, and they use that to decorate the uh, inside of the church. Now, if you have a garden and you have as many deer as I do, you would love to have a walled garden like this one. I mean, how they ever built that is just absolutely amazing. It had to be about 12 feet tall. And uh, it was uh, uh, amazing. It went all around the garden. And you get walk inside and you can see how the this is all meticulously maintained by the nuns there. there. If you look at the other direction, which is right here, you can see they have a greenhouse there where they grow a lot of their uh, fruits, uh, vegetables, and then the flowers for the garden. But they're they grow in a lot of these, more so over here, these plots have a lot of uh, veg, fruits and vegetables. So they grow a lot of their own food there. So they're pretty pretty much uh, independent there. Now, with all the religious conflicts, you have the Irish that are Catholic, the English that are Protestant. And for the longest time, uh, it was 
they could not practice their religion. Uh, they also did, the English discouraged education among the, uh, the Irish, that they weren't allowed to be educated. Uh, there were a lot of uh, sore points there. I mean, the, the Irish have a lot of valid complaints. But uh, this one was in the middle of the woods, and you walk in, and they've restored it to a degree now. Uh, and you can see where the, uh, uh, this is where they would hold religious, secret religious services so that the British wouldn't uh, find out about it. And you can see how there's a stream that goes through it. And you don't hear any sounds, uh, just the the water. It's just very peaceful there. Uh, it, it was a, an incredible spot, uh, very, very uh, moving. Uh, you know, you get there and it's just, like I said, you don't hear traffic. You don't hear anything. You walk in the woods and you come to this beautiful area. This one's sort of a house. This is more of a tribute to my grandparents. Uh, they... Uh, uh, the, when the Perrys and Corrigans lived in uh, uh, Donegal, they uh, had a house that was similar to this. I have a picture that from uh, probably the 1920s or so where they had a thatched roof. I also have a more modern picture of it. And the modern picture is uh, uh, they use these tiles now, the slate tiles. Um, the insurance companies do not like thatched roofs they have a tendency to burn and the fire department doesn't like the uh slate the uh, tiles roof tiles because who wants to go in a burning building with a ton of rocks over your head so uh it's interesting they got to come up with some sort of uh um something in between but anyways this was just uh your tip like your typical irish house we then ended up in kilrono Kilronan Castle. This had been in the family for 400 years, same family. They still own it. Uh, the castle was built in the 1800s. Um, they have the on the right-hand side, you can see where there's a, another building that was made for their hotel. It's all run by a hotel management company. We didn't know this at the beginning. We didn't sign up for it, but uh, the people we uh, happened to be on the tour with, they... Uh, were uh, reenactors like here we have that King Richard's Fair in Kava where the people dress up and uh, pretend that it's medieval times and that's what these people would do there was a whole I don't know six or eight of them that did it and one of them was their seamstress and uh, so she was very interested in something and uh, I've got ahead of myself she's very interested in the next slide but you have this uh, floating stairway that goes up in this castle it, it was really spectacular uh it was one of those you know i looked at it and i do i really want to use it but uh yeah it was safe it didn't didn't seem to move anyways uh but it is kind of weird how they have that up going up there but the seamstress she was very fascinated with these uh uh beautiful uh stained glass windows she took a lot of pictures of them and being she said oh yeah you know for her you know take out probably me uh i wouldn't live so long but she was going to go through and reproduce these she said i can easily get buy some cloth and i know the colors and so she uh was going to uh her the people that she works with would probably be dressed like this next time you see them because she's she was going to go home and reproduce them so then we went to Strokestown Park. It is the Irish National Famine Museum. Uh, if you read down the bottom, uh, when the blight devastated the potato crop, over two and a half million people, which was one quarter of the population, either died or immigrated. There is a book, uh, might be in your library, probably not, uh, called Voyage of Mercy by Steve uh, Pulio. He lives down here in, uh, I think he's from Duxbury. But uh, uh, don't quote me on that. He's down this way somewhere. Uh, and uh, yeah, he, he wrote on some of the uh, relief that the United States sent over to Ireland to uh, shiploads of food that they sent, all donated, no, no cost. But uh, this place, uh, there were some elderly sisters that lived in this uh, huge estate. Uh, let's go. They lived here. And like everybody else that owns a place like that, they could not afford to keep it up. 
In fact, you could see uh, that they took down a, a picture. You know, you could see the outline of the wall. It was a big picture. And then they'd put like a smaller picture up and they would sell the big picture. Uh, and uh, they, some of those pictures uh, are worth millions now. They're, they're done by uh, famous artists of the uh, 1800s and 1700s. Um, if you walk in there, there is a mural of one of their ancestors. He was in charge of the British troops at New Orleans, the Battle of New Orleans, and uh, he ended up dying there. But uh, his lordship would live here. He was quite a guy. You know, I, I may have told you how much the English uh, love the Irish and the Irish love the English and how much they respected each other. Um, his lordship, well, first of all, the bottom, uh, if you look at the main building, the bottom uh, windows uh, on, the, uh, on the left side of the building, that was his uh, dining room. And he would get there for breakfast every morning. Now on the the curved building that you see on the left, that is where the servants and uh, people who worked in the gardens and all would live in the stables. And they would walk across over to the right side, which is where the stables and the uh, garden was behind that beautiful uh, garden that they had back there. And uh, so his lordship would be there. And every morning he would be trying to eat, but he would be see these poor Irish, you know, uneducated and Catholic, you know, walking by his window. So what he did is he put in a tunnel so that uh, the people wouldn't walk by his window. Uh, he was he was quite a guy. Um, he also, he owned everything in the area and people lived there at his discretion. So the main town, if he was going somewhere, he owned the town. Uh, he had a big uh, alarm bell up on the top of the building. And if he was going out and he was traveling through town, they would ring the, the alarm and all of the people knew they had to immediately hide so that he didn't have to see them. Um, you know, and, and I mentioned to you there were numerous revolts. I'm sure the Irish, uh, the English had no idea why the Irish kept revolting, but the treatment was incredible. Um, so the sisters, um, they were finally convinced by their kids to move out of there. They had there were three sisters. Uh, they only lived in like three of the rooms because they couldn't afford to heat it. Uh, and they auctioned the house off, and the town actually won this and they said okay we'll now that we own it we're going to uh have functions there there's a lot of land there they they actually had like a king richard's fair type of thing that just finished when we got there that had finished that weekend we were there on a monday and uh you uh so they the town won they had never been in it no one had been in it they auctioned it off kids handed them the keys and said okay it's yours see you later so uh, they had no idea what they bought, but up in the attic, they found all of the documents for the estate. And this went back to uh, about the 1700s, all the documentation, everything was saved. And especially the parts that's important is the potato famine. And they had all the records on that estate. So that is why this became an, uh, potato, the potato famine uh, museum. Now, the kids, like I said, they were just so happy. They got a big check for the building and they just walked away. And if you guys are fans of the road show, you know, you'd go through this like I did. I was going through there going ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. You know, I couldn't believe the stuff they left behind. Uh, in the one of the other rooms, they had this huge globe that was like from the 1700s. Uh, and uh, they also had a... Uh, grandfather clock and we've all heard them chime you know like the westminster chime and but it wasn't working when they bought this so they all chipped in different businesses everyone chipped in to to uh, restore the clock and they had a big party everyone had champagne and they brought it up to like one minute at 12 and and finally the clock struck 12 and it starts playing god save the king 
not Westminster chimes. Uh, and then it dawned on him, well, yeah, this was a British royalty. His lordship lived here. That that was his his clock. So, of course, you know, they were all laughing, thinking uh, we paid all this money to restore this and our ancestors would be rolling in, a, in their graves. But again, these kids took off. If you, again, the road show, look at those cars, look at those push cars. Uh, I mean, th th this was incredible. I'm looking at it and I'm drooling. I mean, this this is all these historic things. Uh, now, what the sisters did is they, they did try to uh, upgrade the uh, uh, the building a little bit. They wanted the kitchen torn out and they said, uh, and then put in a new kitchen. So the architect came in and he looked at it and he was speechless for a while. And once he gained his composure, he said, I have a cheaper way. He said, let's just build a wall here. No one will see the old kitchen. And you walk down this hallway and where the food prep was, that's what we're gonna turn into your kitchen. You've got water there. We'll put in a nice new sink. We'll put in the refrigerator and a stove there. So they were happy with that, especially since it wasn't going to cost them that much. Well, when these people bought this mansion, they started looking around and they started doing measurements. And they're like, there shouldn't be a wall here. So they got out some sledgehammers and they took the wall down. And they found a perfectly, uh, re not even restored, an original 1850s uh, type of uh, kitchen. These were all left behind. None of the pots have been replaced. You can see the spit there with in the chains where the uh, a roast would have been cooked over a fire. And right next to it, there's a spigot where you would get hot water out of. Uh, all of this was original and nothing. The, the architect who put in the, the kitchen for the women, um, thank God he did that. He saved it all. So this is a, a, a museum in its in its in its place. Just uh, um just sitting there and they they had no use for it they had all these uh, uh different uh plates and things like that just uh and they're, they're not reproductions uh, you may say well i have something similar to that but these are all original so the I, I mentioned to you that they had all the documentation in this house of the irish potato famine uh they went through the museum uh well they made the museum and uh uh, they have things like this they found and they were able to put in. This was a big uh, kettle that they would use to make their uh, soup. They had a, they had they, the the English um, would would make soup for the people, and uh, they uh, they had a specific menu uh, recipe on how to make it in modern nutritionists have looked at that recipe and said, well, they were probably only getting 10% of their need. Um, the, the, but it was cheap. It was cheap for the British to make, and uh, and they really didn't care uh, whether the people were nourished or not. Now, they mentioned a famine. I think a famine of, of no food. Well, there must have been some fish in the streams, right? Or in the ponds. But his lordship, owned that. And if you were caught fishing, of course, that's poaching. So you couldn't eat the fish or anything like that. And during this time period, they were raising sheep. You could get more for the sheep in England than you could selling it to the Irish. So they, they were exporting food during the famine. And this is why you have such animosity, especially uh, at that time period, against the British. The Americans were loading up ships. There's the one Forbes, Mr. Forbes, uh, familiar name, uh, took a, a, a ship. He was a, a captain and all his crew were volunteers. They loaded up this ship. The, it was actually a, a warship that they borrowed from the uh, Navy and uh, took it over and delivered all this food to the people uh, in, uh, in in Ireland. And the uh, other New York, Baltimore, uh, New Orleans, they were all shipping food over. The, uh, if you were a businessman, you would probably buy uh, food and then put it on the uh, the ship to be shipped over. And uh, farmers would donate some of their food to the uh, to the cause. And also, you know, you think that they'd be 
uh, if there's such a, a a famine that they would have uh, you know done more. Uh, somebody raised their hand. I see. What? Uh, yeah, it could have been the. They call it the Irish Potato Famine uh, Museum. That is what they have on the signs, rather than the Great Hunger. Um, I, I don't know why, but it uh, uh, it is a good. Uh, uh, it, it's known as the Irish Potato uh, Famine because of the blight. Uh, that's about all I can think of. That's what it's more famously known as, I guess. But uh, yeah, these people, they were starving and the whole time they're shipping food out of the country. Um, what a crime. Uh, and uh, the guy who's in charge of making the soup and providing for the people of Ireland, uh, he believed that you should work. If you're going to be uh, um, getting something, you should work for it. So what he did is uh, he... Uh, had public works to so these people are starving he has them out building this big stone wall and we saw one of them it kind of went up the side of a hill and then made a big loop and came back down it did absolutely nothing but this guy just felt that the people should work for their food not uh, it shouldn't be given to them it might make them lazy but when you're starving you know uh how much work do you get out of these people if they're starving all right, let's, uh, and my computer just froze, so bear with me. Oh, don't do this. Luckily, there's only one or two more. Uh, okay, yeah, and, and they, they shipped a lot of people uh, to Canada and to the U.S. Uh, it was cheaper to pay for their uh, uh fair over to the United States than it was to get uh, uh, that it was to feed them. And of course, if you did, if they did leave, you had some, uh, you could always advertise for some good uh, English uh, Protestants to come and take their place. So uh, the, yeah, it was just uh, a, dis a really uh, disgusting time of uh, uh, what they did to the people. This is Trinity College. We're back in Dublin. We've made the big loop, established in 1597 under the rule of Queen Elizabeth I. And stored here in their library, they have the Book of Kells. This was a monastery that they found all these religious uh, books that were all hand-colored. Uh, they did it probably by candlelight. This is a postcard because they don't make they don't allow you to take flashes of the, and pictures of the actual uh, documents, but uh, all of this was hand colored. Uh, it was absolutely gorgeous. This is the library. Uh, they uh, somebody raised their hand too. Uh, this is the library. It's all done in cedar, Canadian cedar. Uh, I can't get into it right now. Yeah, it was a one, when the potato crop uh, failed, it was a more of a one crop, but they also, uh, they also did grains. They also had some grains that they would raise there. Uh, so uh, uh, the potato family took, that was the main staple, but there's no reason why they couldn't have eaten other things if the British had supplied it to them. Instead, the United States took everything, uh, uh, gave them more than their own uh, country, their own uh, rulers, shall we say. Uh, this is the library. They don't use the Dewey Decimal System here. They have a little different way of filing things. You have big books on the bottom and little books on the top. That way, if you drop one of the books, you don't do too much damage uh, if there's someone under you or the uh, the book doesn't take such a beating. Uh, a little, little bit uh, unique way of uh, arranging your stacks. Yeah, the minute I go into chat, my computer freezes, guys. So I'm going to just do that at the end. Here's another picture of the uh, library. And uh, you can see the busts. They have all the famous uh, literary giants and um, uh, scientists are all there. 
And this is the uh, last place we stayed at Fitzpatrick Castle. It's now, of course, a hotel, 1741. So this one was a little older. Uh, if you look down on the lower side on the right, you see the uh, entrance to the dungeon. And uh, the dungeon was usually a good place to set up a bar. Uh, and most of them, it is the dungeon bar. And on this one, uh, as you enter, again, what do they have? But a nice, warm, welcoming fire going in the fireplace. And uh, this is, we're getting ready to leave uh, that night. Uh, uh, this is where we stayed that night. Looking over at Dublin at night, you see a plane taking off there. And as we were going home, I look out the window and I couldn't pass it up. I had to uh, take this... Uh, picture of Ireland from uh, the air uh, before we got, uh, there was a lot of clouds, couldn't see anything. And then all of a sudden it just opened up and I lucked out. So I just immediately uh, snapped a shot of it. So you can see what Ireland looks like from the, uh, from the air. So uh, since I had trouble getting the last one, I'm not going to play this one. So thank you very much for coming. 330 people. Uh, I'm giving a talk, uh, on the Civil War, I think it's in April, and it will not be uh, as boring as your high school history classes. So hopefully, I get 300 people showing up for that. But let me check the the chats and see what. Uh, uh, let's just wow! I have a lot of questions to answer here. Uh, now, the first ones were. Lots of great comments. One, the question that I saw come up a couple times was, what was the name of the touring company that you used for the tour? That That's a white, that's a question for my wife. Uh, uh, you would have to ask. Um, let me, uh, I know where, uh, it's in my car, shoot. Um, all right, uh, let me check with the missus and, uh, and, and at the, uh, just before we go, I'll, I'll do that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not promoting any certain uh, one. I, I went to uh, a different company when I, I looked at another one because I enjoyed Ireland so much. And it's amazing. They have uh, a, a similar tour, but it uh, it hit all the places we did not go. And one place I had no didn't really want to uh, go to was the uh, the Blani Stone. I had no interest in kissing the Blani Stone. Uh, but uh yeah, the lamppost, somebody said, would that be Art Nouveau? Yeah, probably. Um, very, uh, you just don't see that anymore. Uh, uh, first Guinness ever, yeah. Um, other people have been there as you drive around the corner and see the castle that is breathtaking. Yes, okay. Uh, sorry about the, I don't know, There's it's a Zoom setting host Share host audio. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I did not realize that I had to do that. Uh, how was the food? Food was very good. If you saw the restaurant that we were in, we were not staying at Burger King or anything like that. It, 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 most of the places, there was there was one time um, we, had, we were sort of on our own for lunch and we were in this small town and it was the cutest little town. Uh, and there was a a tea shop there and they serve tea and muffins and all. And we just sat there and we just had the best time talking to some of the people. Uh people were very friendly. Um you know so it was uh it was it was pretty cool. You, you can uh you should take time from these uh tours to just kind of enjoy the local uh um local characters and uh let me just see what else uh Yeah, the statue at the entrance of the cliffs. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Where they are, there rails on the, by the cliff. Uh, they had a, a a fence there that just kind of kept you, you you know don't get any closer than this. Uh, so uh, that was your warning. Uh, a lot of places, especially when we were in Aust uh, Australia. There was one place that really should have had a railing, and I mentioned it. I said, "Don't they put up railings here to the to our tour guide?" 
He goes, and I was like, well, if you're that stupid to get that close, and which I thought was an interesting way of looking at things. Uh, we, uh, you know, right away you, you have a, a, a lawyer who's going to sue and there. They, they, they look at it differently. Like, well, you shouldn't have been that close. So uh, uh, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And someone even mentioned that afterwards, no, no rails, not as lit, lit, uh yeah, they don't they don't sue like they do here. Uh, Kyle Moore, did I misspell that? I'm gonna have to check that. Uh, yeah, Voyage of Mercy uh, by Stephen Puglio is available through MVLC. Uh, they I'm have a, yep, they, there's uh, somebody has it there. Um, it, I had his. I, I heard him talk on the caning, which is a civil law, which is my specialty, and. Uh, when I heard after I heard that, I decided I'd read his uh, Voyage of Mercy. Uh, okay, so someone Googled once introduced in Ireland and Europe, light spread rapidly by mid August of 1845. It had reached much of Europe, uh, Northern and Central Europe, Belgium, Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah, the, the crop failed. They, they, uh, but they, they, it really was to me the the English did not want their food markets disrupted by keeping too much food in Ireland and you know and it would increase the price of food for the English so they just kept uh getting the exports from Ireland and uh that that's just uh kind of uh cruel really All right, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and any of my bad humor that they might have thrown in there. Uh, the trip was about 10 days, uh, but of course, you know how they do that. They say, oh, it's going to be uh, 10 days, and then it's uh, uh, the first day is traveling there, and the last day is coming home. So you really only get like eight days of traveling. But uh, uh, the mansions were, were just spectacular. Um, Uh, do I do in-person presentations in Norton? Yeah, I sometimes do. Uh, I mostly go to assisted livings. Um, they, uh, a lot of those people can't get anywhere. Their travel days are over. And uh, when I go there, I, you know, we've been through the Amazon rainforest, took, you know, a, a cruise, a uh, river cruise through the Amazon. We did another one through Europe. And, uh, you know, I've got some some decent ones, Yellowstone National Park, which is actually, that's probably one of the more boring ones. Uh, the others are more exotic. Uh, Galapagos Islands. Uh, they don't live in the house. Somebody said you mentioned about a building not having a roof. Uh, how can anyone live in a building without a roof? No, they don't live there, but they, it might be, they might have a house in front. And uh, they, uh, so they take the roof off. And a couple of people were more daring than I am. They kissed the Blarney Stone. Uh, if I only had time for one or two, what do I? Um, Kilronan was pretty good on the uh, for the favorite castle. Um, you could walk through the castle, and then you had hundreds of acres that. Again, we'd go hiking, and you'd be scaring deer when you go out in the early morning. Uh, you'd see them all around you. Uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, they don't have skunks and stuff like that. So you don't have to worry too much. Um, yeah, there's castles and there's a Dublin castle. Somebody mentioned, uh, somebody's going in June. Can't wait to see your pictures. Uh, and someone's going in November. My next trip is, uh, the Canadian Rockies. All right. If you want to wait two minutes, let me see if my wife, I'm just going to see if she knows what, what travel agency we went through. So hold on to that. And, uh, and Claire was wondering if we are related. If Claire wants to get in touch with me, Dana Ziza at gmail.com. Easy to remember. Uh, Dana Ziza at uh, gmail.com. And uh, I can probably trace you if you say you're related to Wilhelm down in uh, New Jersey, then uh, yeah, I've got him uh, or the 
two uncles that ended up in Minnesota. So I can help you out clear. Um, hang on just a minute. Yeah, I think, what was the name of the company? For, for, for Ireland? Cool company? All right, let me, all right. All right, well, we're 70, you know, so uh, you're trying to remember six years ago is a little bit tough. We, we don't sometimes use... Some people will use the same travel agent all the time. Uh, not uh, uh, we we travel to. We'll go around and see who do we think has the best, uh, and then we'll do it from there. Uh, Cindy, is there anything else you need? No, that is that is it. Thank you so much. This was a, an outstanding presentation. Right. And Claire, if you're still on, uh, definitely, uh, uh, I'd love to hear from you. I, uh, I've got, like I said, about eight or 900 names of dead people. I can link you to it. Um, we, uh, I just, I've discovered cousins and I did the ancestry DNA and all that. So that will, uh, that'll be good. All right. Uh, if that's it, then, uh, I will, uh, go down and watch TV. Yeah, unless uh, Cindy, you're all you're all set with me. I am uh, for now, but with such a great turnout, we'll we'll definitely ha get you back. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Somebody wanted to know if they can check back on Facebook. Um, I'm, I'll get. I'll send it to you, but I don't. I I never do Facebook. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm seventy. Um, I don't, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll send the, I'll email it to you. Uh, is Dana still there? She is not. Uh, she, she, she's not. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me, I, I probably have your email too. Uh, if you if send not, it to Dana, I'll, I'll get it. Okay. All right. And uh, I'll find out what the name of the company was. And if you could post it on your Facebook page, uh, it, but I'm, I'm not endorse. I don't want to be accused of endorsing somebody over, you know, it's just, uh, that's just the, the, uh, um, you know, it just happens to be the company that we went with, but they were very, very good. I got to admit. All right. That should, should be it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, you guys stuck with me to the end. So, uh, uh, that's good. And hopefully I think it's the end of April. Again, you know, short stories of the Civil War. I will tell you about stuff people you've never heard of before. Um, people like uh, uh, Corporal uh, uh, Private uh, Newell Tabor or uh, George Foster Robinson. Uh, you know, and these are people that you, you're going to have to hunt. If you, I don't think you'll find Newell Tabor anywhere. But uh, um, yeah, they, in what they did or what they're famous for and how little recognition some of them get. You know, those stories that leave you scratching your head saying, I never knew that. Uh, that's mostly what my short stories of the Civil War is. So hopefully you can join me on that. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I know.